Okay, B-Bio, we're getting into the, the major part of our curriculum that we are working through. And we're going to take a look at molecular genetics, DNA, RNA, gene expression. Um, so here's a beautiful picture of DNA. Um, back in January, we learned about this. This was chapter 14, and you can see our beautiful double helix. Okay, over here we can see the uh, bases in the middle that are holding it together. Um, we have two sides to the polymer. And um, what's really important about DNA is its stability, right? It's a very stable molecule. Um, it can be easily replicated, um, but we also can preserve the genetic code because the important thing is we spent all this time uh, evolving and having a, a gene sequence that is really um, ideal. And the last thing you want to do is have it get messed up by mutation. So our DNA has many ways to make sure that the genetic information is preserved and conserved from generation to generation, okay? So a couple of things here. We know that the genetic material has to be stable, and that stability comes from hydrogen bonds holding it together, okay? Individually, those bonds are weak, but collectively, they're very stable and strong. Um, that's critical to holding both sides of the strand together. Um, the other key piece is the phosphodiester bonds in the sugar phosphate backbone, okay? Very strong, very stable, um, and that provides a lot of structural integrity to the molecule. And just the nature of the double helix itself, the structure of itself of the helix is stable. It's energetically stable. Um, bases are on the interior. We have negative phosphates on the outside that are far away from each other. The outside is polar. The inside is a little bit less polar. Um, and so that helps to ensure that it's very stable. And then the other thing we have, um, is that any damage that occurs is repaired easily by enzymes in eukaryotes. So we have a lot of DNA repair that goes on. Um, we can take care of double-stranded DNA that has double-stranded errors in it and repair that. Um, the other thing is it has to be easily uh, and accurately reproduced. I almost forgot, telomeres. Um, telomeres, responsible for stability um, related to the aging process. And again, that helps keep our DNA um, very stable and resistant to damage. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the other thing is, as we said, it's easily and accurately reproduced. We have the enzyme that goes in there and unzips the double helix. That's the DNA helicase. Breaks the bonds between the bases so that we can get to it. And it's also copied accurately. Okay, with the enzymes that do the copying, not only are they copying with high fidelity, um, but they're using the original template to make the two new strands. So you know that you're making a copy of something that was originally made uh, with high fidelity and the sequences of bases that's serving as the template for the new dna sequences okay and of course we have proofreading enzymes which are involved in making sure that we conserve the genetic code as we go from generation to generation so during mitosis when we replicate the dna and during meiosis when we replicate the dna all of this is going on this proofreading ensuring that we're accurately copying the, the helix okay um the other thing is it has to be complex, and we know that there's lots of complexity in the base sequence, okay? Again, we talked about this. You have four bases, A, T, C, G. They each form these three base codons, and we know that there are 64 possible three base codons that code for the 20 amino acids and the stop codons. Um, so what this means is you have an infinite base sequence combination, okay? That provides tremendous variation for proteins, okay? In addition, we know that many different codons code for proteins and that we have many different sizes of polypeptides so we can get different gene sequences to code for that. Um, and the other thing that adds to this complexity is eukaryotic genes. We have introns, right? Introns that don't code for polypeptide, but we know that they code for regulatory RNA, right? They can code for miRNA, siRNA. They code for tRNA. They code for rRNA, okay? Um, and we know that these introns can be highly variable and they can be used for various types of testing and paternity and forensics. Okay. And then we have exons, which code for the polypeptides. Okay. Again, that is unique to eukaryotes. Prokaryotes do not have introns. They only contain exogenous sequences or exons. Okay. Okay. Let's take a look at the structure. Um, <clears throat> regardless of organism, the DNA structure is the same. DNA is always a double helix. Even in bacteria, bacteria have one chromosome. They have one circular chromosome, but it is a double helix, okay? Uh, 
key thing with the double helix is it's made up of repeating subunits. Those monomers are the nucleotides, the phosphate sugar base. Bonding, again, hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases. They're weak and collectively very strong. Phosphodiesters are in the backbone. Okay. Uh, we have complementary base pairing, A with G, C with T. Okay. We know that one side of the double helix complements the other. Um, purines and pyrimidines. Purines are A and G. Remember, pyrimidines, if you remember pyramids, the stones were cut. So if you remember C-U-T, that's a pyrimidine. A purine always pairs with a, pairs with a pyrimidine. Okay? Um, and when you do this, um, this pairing, you can see immediately why. Um, purines and pyrimidines, okay, they have two hydrogen bonds, whereas uh, A and T, and then the purine-pyrimidine combo G-C, has three hydrogen bonds. So a G and a C pair up well because of the number of hydrogen bonds between them. Okay, A and T only form two. So an A-G combination would not work well because you would not have the proper hydrogen bonding going on. Okay, um, and so it's the hydrogen bonds between the bases that permits the proper pairing of A with T and C with G. Okay, and the other thing to note is here's your nucleotide. Okay, your nucleotide is made up of the phosphate the sugar and the base, okay? And then in this backbone, the sugar phosphate backbone, we have those phosphodiester bonds. That is the bond between the phosphate and the sugar, okay? Um, and that's what provides all that stability for DNA, okay? And again, you look at your adenine thymine base pairing, you can see how they really pair up well, okay? This little dotted line here represents your hydrogen bonding, okay? And over here, we've got three hydrogen bonds. So again, um, if you paired a guanine and a thymine, you wouldn't get the right type of, of hydrogen bonding going on. You'd have an open bond there. It would not work well. Um, and if you tried to pair an adenine with a guanine, okay, the issue there is uh, you have two aromatic rings, okay, which would be too wide. Okay, the, um, let's see if I can change my uh, pointer option here. Yes, I can. Okay, so if you look at this, I try to do this as straight as I can. Um, that is the width of your helix, okay? Um, if you were to put a double ring in a double ring, that would be too wide, okay? And if you tried to put a thymine with a cytosine, now that would be too narrow, okay? And so you would not have the right distance between the bases, and what would happen is your entire um, helix would become extremely... Um, let me just get rid of that. would be extremely unstable because you'd have some areas are too wide and some areas are too narrow. Okay. All right. Moving on. Um, the anti-parallel nature of the helix. This is what always confused people. Okay. Um, each side of the helix is oriented opposite the other. Okay. The reason why it's set that way is so that the bases could pair up properly. Okay. If you took this sugar phosphate combo here, and uh, with the with the base, and you didn't have it going upside down, okay, uh, and inverted, the base would be stuck on the outside, okay, and it wouldn't pair up to the correct angle. So by inverting one side, it ensures that the bases are on the inside. One of the issues that Watson and Crick discovered with other models is that they had the phosphates on the inside and the bases sticking out on the outside. But that didn't work out because the phosphates are negatively charged, and you would wind up with tremendous charge repulsion. So in order to get the bases to pair up correctly on the inside, one side of the helix had to run opposite the other, okay? And so we call that five prime, three prime uh, orientation. And the way you figure it out is you look at the sugar, okay? The deoxyribose sugar, the first carbon is carbon number one. This is always attached to the base, okay? So that's always attached to your base. Two, three, four, five run their way up the outside. Now number three binds to a phosphate, okay, that's here, which is going then to attach to another carbon down here, to the next sugar, okay? Carbon number five is going to attach to another phosphate on the top, okay? And so what you're looking at here is, this is carbon number five right here, attached to that phosphate, and here's carbon number three. So when you're looking at this molecule, you're starting at the three prime end down here and working your way up. On the other side, you'll notice that you're looking at the three prime end over here, okay? And your five prime end is 
here. And this is going three to five in the opposite direction. Okay. Now, why is this important? It's important in DNA replication because DNA polymerase only reads three prime to five prime. So you're going to read both sides in opposite directions. Okay. And that's how that works. Okay. Um, when you semi-conservatively replicate, what you're doing is you're taking each DNA molecule, you're copying it from the original strand, and each strand contains half new and half old template DNA, okay? And so you can see that here in this diagram. The original parent strand is represented by the blue, the pink is the new DNA that's been replicated, and each of the daughter strands is half old, half new, okay? And when you go to the second generation, you can see that each is half old, half new, but then these are both new because one is copied from the new template from above, okay? Now, DNA, when it replicates, um, before we get into the, the details of it, what's important to remember is that we're always transforming, uh, transmitting genetic information from one generation to the next through either DNA or RNA. Um, Non-eukaryotic organisms, basically prokaryotes, bacteria, their DNA is always circular, okay? And that circular DNA is made up of a double helix. So here's your bacterial DNA. This is the chromosome right here, okay? It's double stranded, okay? It's got a double helix, okay? It's one chromosome, okay? And so when they replicate their DNA, there's only one replication origin, right? And that's the origin just where the DNA replication begins, okay? Eukaryotes, we have multiple linear chromosomes, okay? So we have lots of DNA that has to be copied. Um, now, a plasmid, which we've talked about, is that small circular piece of DNA. It's double-stranded. Um, that's found in bacteria. And bacteria can have multiple plasmids. They replicate these at the same time as the main chromosome so that when you create new bacteria, those plasmids get passed on to the next generation. And that's how we're able to maintain uh, certain types of genes within bacterial uh, populations. Okay? Let me erase my ink. Moving on, here we go. So the way that DNA is uh, organized in eukaryotes um, is very different than what we see in prokaryotes. And this is an important thing. Um, what we've got here is um, a typical eukaryotic chromosome. Okay, so we're gonna start small, DNA double helix, right? So this double helix DNA um, normally is not seen like this, okay? This is how it appears in prokaryotes. They don't have any proteins associated. But what happens with eukaryotes is these histone proteins they bind to the DNA at specific sequences, and they trigger it to coil up, okay? And as that DNA coils up, it forms these clusters called nucleosomes. Now, these clusters are then going to coil up on themselves, and they're going to form coils, right? Now, these coils themselves are going to then form larger supercoils, okay? We call this chromatin, right? Remember, chromatin, it's unique to eukaryotes. It's DNA plus the associated histone proteins, okay? That's going to supercoil up and form chromosomes. Now, why do we form chromosomes? It's all about efficiency. X-shaped chromosomes only appear when a cell is ready to divide. It's just a nice way to package the DNA so that it can be distributed evenly from one cell to the next. Normally, our cells exist as diffuse chromosome like uh, chromatin like this. It's supercoiled DNA that has not condensed into a chromosome. Okay, And this DNA stays like this with these proteins bound tightly to the genes. And if you remember with epigenetics, remember the Licky Rats mo uh, module we did? Um, what will happen with that is sometimes the DNA will uncoil in response to environmental conditions, different types of compounds, methyl groups, demethylating, and so on. And that's going to trigger the DNA to be accessible so that genes in this region here are accessible, where the genes that are in here are inaccessible. Okay. Once the genes get um, coiled up, they're off. You can't get to them. Okay. And again, there are a couple of reasons why we have supercoiling. One is a practical reason. It's so we can condense the DNA and store it in the nucleus. Remember, there's a ton of DNA in a eukaryotic cell, six feet of DNA in a human cell. So that needs to be supercoiled and condensed down so it can fit. And the other reasoning why we have the supercoiling is it's going to help us with controlling gene expression. When the DNA is coiled up, we can't express the genes. Okay. All right, moving on, um, we know that new molecules are synthesized 
um, from the template. And so the first thing that happens with replication is we have a topo isomerase that comes in, gyrase. It uncoils the DNA. Okay? It relaxes the coiling. It flattens it out. Okay? So it looks like a flat ladder. Then helicase comes in and it breaks those hydrogen bonds and it opens up the bases. Okay? Once that occurs, a DNA primase enzyme comes in and it puts a primer of RNA on the DNA. Okay, and that primer is a starting point. That's the point where polymerase can attach and begin copying. DNA polymerase can only add to an existing double strand. So that primer goes in there as a starting point so that DNA polymerase can attach. Okay, the primer is made of RNA. Later on, exonucleases help pull that out. Okay, uh, then the polymerase just moves along and it synthesizes the new DNA template until it gets to the end and it reads three prime to five prime. Okay. Um, so it's going to add nucleotides as it's moving along and it's going to read three prime to five prime and the new strand is made five to three. It's complementary. Complementary means it's opposite. Okay. Um, once that's done, exonucleases usually go right in behind this and they remove any incorrect uh, DNA bases. Okay. Um, DNA polymerase has the ability to move backwards one base to remove errors. Um, but then there are other exonucleases that come in and do the proofreading to make sure that we've really copied this DNA well, and we're, we're ready to rock and roll. And then we have ligase, and this is the one that everybody likes. Ligase links. It links the Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand by forming these phosphodiester bonds, okay? So um, the lagging strand, remember, is the strand that's made in short segments, where the leading strand is made in one continuous strand, okay? Now, here's what it looks like, leading and lagging, okay? DNA helicase comes in here, opens up the double helix. DNA polymerase is attaching here. So just imagine now that the helicase started here, opening up this helix, okay? Over here, we have our DNA polymerase attaching, and the polymerase is reading three to five this way. As it's reading three to five, it's creating a new strand five to three. So this is known as the continuous leading strand, okay? And the way you know that is the polymerase is going into the replication fork. Okay, on the opposite side, the polymerase can only read it in short segments. And the reason for that is a polymerase is, let's say it attaches here, okay, it's going to move in this direction. Once it gets to this point, it encounters a double-stranded piece of DNA and it falls off, okay? Now, while this is copying in this direction, this helix continues to open. And so at some point, there's going to be another opening here as this unzips where you're going to want to copy another segment. Okay, and when you copy this, you're going to copy it until you get to where you were at the previous spot. Okay, in this fashion, this strand is made discontinuously in little fragments, and these are called Okazaki fragments. Now, what's going to connect these to each other? Ligase. Ligase comes in and it forms a phosphodiester bond between each of these fragments. Okay, and then the whole strand is complete. So, the only reason why you have leading and lagging strands is to understand the direction of replication. The lagging strand is always made in the direction coming out of the replication fork. The leading strand is made moving towards the replication fork. Okay? And that's how we replicate the DNA. Okay? Now, retroviruses, they're going to use reverse transcriptase. It's an enzyme that copies the viral RNA genome into DNA and then puts it into the host genome. Okay? Um, so they go in reverse of the flow of genetic information. Genetic information is always DNA to RNA to protein. This goes RNA to DNA, and then the DNA gets copied into RNA in the cell, and it makes protein, okay? But retroviruses are called retro because they go backwards, okay? And that's a unique case of replication, okay? Um, just a couple of points here with prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. I got some weird circles on here. Um, prokaryotes, they have that circular chromosome. It's that single circular chromosome located in the cytoplasm. They don't have any histones. They do not supercoil, therefore they do not have chromatin, okay? And the other thing with prokaryotes is they have no introns, so they do not need to splice introns out of their DNA, okay? All of their DNA codes for protein. With eukaryotes, we're much more complicated. Our chromosomes are linear. We have many chromosomes which are kept in the nucleus. We have the histones which bind to the DNA and that causes it to supercoil, and that supercoiling is important so that we can condense the DNA down and store a tremendous amount of DNA in a small location, okay? The introns, remember, they're non-coding, 
okay? They don't code for protein. They do code for other things, though. Most of the time, it's for different types of RNA, okay? Um, and then we have exons, okay, which are the functional protein coding sequences, okay? And then finally, with eukaryotes, we have proofreading. We have the exonuclease activity, which is involved in uh, identifying DNA errors and getting rid of those DNA errors, okay? So we reduce mutation, okay? And that's it for DNA replication and DNA structure. Again, uh, feel free to look it up on Edpuzzle. I will have a few videos up for you guys. And if you still have any questions about it, please reach out to me, okay? Um, good luck with everything this week, and um, I'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Bye.